welcome to space. I, I think we just really wanted to sort of touch on some topics about uh, XRPL gaming and gaming in general and NFTs. And, you know, I'd love to hear some overview and thoughts from, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a few different perspectives here as we have a few different RippleX team members and some XRP Cafe team members and um, myself from Zertmon. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty much just keen to hear everyone's thoughts and opinions on where the ecosystem is at in terms of NFTs and gaming and what we're sort of expecting for that sort of um, that sort of stuff on the XRPL throughout this year. Yeah, I would start um, with, let's look, I would love to see what other chains, like not only XRPL right now, are doing. Um, I think they are... I would just mention a couple. I have my. I mean, there are a dozen small ones, but let's just take the big ones. I think Yuga Labs is one of the big ones, right? Um, what they're doing, and of course, um, Futureverse, uh, Root Network is also one of the larger ones, and um, so they're really great and, and big in, in that regard. And yeah, so I I would love to hear from Sloppy because I know he's uh, very much into cross chain. Um, what his thoughts are on on current state of, I guess, Web3 gaming in general is. So, so Web3 gaming and NFTs basically combined. Um, what, what are you seeing on other chains in, in general? Well, yeah, no, for sure. Just to, just to start, like, uh, I'll just kind of go over the XRPL to begin with. Um, I mean, shout out to Shen and the Zertmon team, just because, you know, the whole gaming scene within the XRPL prior to you guys launching your product you know, it was very minimal, if any, at all. And then you guys kind of came in. I know you guys started like anonymous at first, and everybody's like, "Oh, who's that? Who's uh, who's behind the Zertmon team?" And then you guys released that Discord game, where you know there is so many layers to it. Um, you guys can still hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. You can perfect. hear. Yeah, there's so many layers to it that it almost feels like not like a AAA developer, but it it went. It goes really deep. You guys have the side missions, you guys can battle, and then all the cards have a factor in terms of how you play. You can play, you know, water against fire, whatever it is. Um, so you guys definitely brought like a kind of a breath of fresh air when it comes to XRPL gaming. Now, um, just in comparison to like other chains, you know, yeah, they're a little bit further ahead just because they've had more time and there's more functionality, like, you know, smart contracts being factored into games. Um, but, you know, just in terms like what you have dirt birds on Cardano that they recently released their outpost, which I guess you can call it a game, but it's in the form of staking. I think they really hit it out of the park with that. I, it's pretty similar to what Yuga Labs has with their other side. I think that. Um, mm -hmm. Is it like a full-fledged full, full -fledged metaverse? Is it a metaverse? No, no, not a full-fledged metaverse. I think. I think they might be going down that line, but you basically have your outpost, which yields token, um, whatever it is. I think it's like derp token or something. Um, but it's it's super cool in, in the sense of like, I don't know, I'm a big fan of their art style. So that's why I'm kind of a little bit of a fanboy for it. But one gaming project that I'd like to touch on is the Pudgy Penguins, just because of their kind of like whole entire story. Um, you know, they released, I think back in 2021, project kind of died and then you know they went under new management uh, i think it was what's his name luca or something he ended Lucanet. up purchasing them yep and then i was playing around in their new metaverse that they have and it's like a 3d version of club penguin and i mean that's that's perfect right there i think you know you can play the game on your phone you don't need like a 3090 ti to be able to play it and i think that's that's a big piece of blockchain gaming right there because majority of users are on their phone. Um, so if you can kind of hit that nail right on the head, then you have a winner. Something, I mean, we just, you guys see this, we just jump right hot into the topic. I think that's the best to, to learn and see what's, what's out there. But to, to that regard, Sloppy, um, do you need a pudgy? Because this is something like, do then games need to be um token gated should they be open what is the entry barrier you know usually it's like you know do you have to purchase first a twenty thousand dollar nft to play the game <laughs> <laughs> you know so i think like, i think the nft should only be on the cosmetic side kind of like what uh, counter-strike does and they do it absolutely perfectly 
you know, you can buy the game for, I think, to get Prime, it's 20 US. And then you have the full Counter-Strike game where you can play competitive, Prime matchmaking, any of the custom games. And then now if you wanted to go a little bit deeper, then you can, you know, purchase skins on a secondary market, open boxes. But going back to your point, um, with the Pudgy game, you're able to play it for free, at least at this current state. But if you have, you know, a Pudgy Penguin NFT, then you can play as your Pudgy, which I think is perfect because, again, I think they're trading at 15 ETH floor right now, which is roughly around 36K or something. So That's expensive for a they, game. If they token gated it to the point where you needed that Penguin to be able to play the game, then, you know, you're going to have a very limited user base. But at this given moment, anybody can download their trial, hop on, run around the world, do some cool stuff. And then, you know, if you like it and you can justify spending 40K on an NFT to have your player in game, then, you know, be my guest, I guess. Yeah, maybe touching on that because I'm, I'm coming more from the Ethereum side of things in terms of origin. And I happen to have met uh, Shen during an acceleration program I was part of. Um, I, I think uh, what worked really well for me on Ethereum was the first game that Yuga Labs released, the, the Duki Dash. I'm not sure if some of you were able to, to play it, but basically the way they token get it is that you needed that ticket to enter the game, and the ticket was obviously given you know, to the Yuga Labs holder with different tires. You could buy the ticket on the secondary, and I think the cheapest one back in the days was probably around, I would say, a little bit less than one ETH. And it gave you, of course, almost no chance to win the game by yourself. Um, so I think that was a good one because you could still have this uh, giant board ape, fort ETH and whatnot. Uh, and you could also just afford for less than one ETH the game. And uh, the big prize, of course, that big uh, Duki Dash uh, key, I think, at the time that they were giving away, uh, was attractive enough for people to come and join. Okay, you pay one is to play, but you might, you know, uh, if you are really good, you might win something that was maybe 100 or 200 is. I think eventually the guy who won the game is a pro gamer, so it was a good way to also uh, merge a little bit the worlds of uh, NFT DJs like ourselves and pro gamers. Um, and the second thing that they did very well, because for me, I would say it's uh, the main concern of those tokenomics, is uh, how do you incentivize people to spend in the native token, not just to receive it. Uh, receiving is easy, right? The publisher of the game just decides to emit tokens on the go. And we know that the more emission there is, the harder it is to sustain that whole economic around the game. And I think when Duki Dash uh, was released, they said basically you are going like Candy Crush back in the days. You are buying some um, uh, boosters uh, in the game in the local currency. And I think it was a very, a very, very good experiment for them. The odd thing for me on the Yuga Lab side is that they kind of like decided it was a one-off hyper casual game. And then they went again into the direction of that huge, clunky, really fucking hard to understand metaverse with so many layers. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a holder myself, but I try to keep track of it. And then after a while, even the, the co-holders, they're like, I'm not sure, you know, what each NFT of the galaxy is connected and, and, and what the use case, should I keep, should I sell? There are so many brands and I think a bit of the pushback uh, that uh, that brand has seen in particular is really around that long, long promise of something will be shipped. And, you know, you, you give crumbs maybe every few months, but now people say uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think when, when Pudgy Penguins come with a super simple game, uh, or when, you know, uh, Sean Wizardman comes with also a super simple game, that's also the essence of what it should be, right? Something simple, you, you come, you can play one minute, you can play 10 minutes, no headache, no calculation, and I think that should be really the, the, the direction that those games should take. I would love to hear Marcus, uh, Pleb's opinion here, if you want to jump in, because you well, already I mean, muted. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think a lot of I mean this is more like a question, right? I mean, what kind of games uh, do you guys think are are, are the ones that are uh, the best fit for for blockchains? Because there there's like do these two different approaches. One is like people who are trying to do AAA games and to benefit from from all of these um, assets on the chain and things like that. 
but without changing like the the, the principal um, value propositions of those uh, expensive to build games. Or the other one is just like what 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 you been also saying, which is like this one click simple game. All of these experimentations that we've we've seen, I, I played in the past. Uh, Avigochi, I've I played like uh, Cosmeth. I, I've been playing like a lot of like almost one click games that, in my opinion, like sometimes <laughs> get more. I mean, we haven't seen a, a big success, but at, at least they're trying uh, different things one by one. And in my mind, like some of, some of these things may may actually work. Uh, just like we're not at that moment yet. I, I also would love to hear Shan about like what the opinion about like the card games, uh, what's different from, from the web 2.0 or that world without incentives and without value and kind of like what, what has changed. Yeah, for sure. I think something which is interesting to look at is to like look at just the general web two gaming space as a whole. And if you look at it these days, like a lot of the games which are pulling the largest numbers in terms of metrics aren't actually like the massive AAA games. Like, you know, a lot of indie and small teams recently over the last year and year or two, like have really been able to like, you know, capture that vir that virality of, of players. And so I, I think a lot of players and, and gamers now re more recently care a lot more about you know, in-game mechanics and design and theory rather than just the prettiest looking graphics, which, you know, if you think about like five years ago or so, or even, you know, three, four years ago, it, it was always just about who could get the best looking graphics and all of that. Um, but I think now, and, you know, you look at games like, yeah, like Pal World just recently, which came out, which, you know, just blew every other AAA game completely out of the water in terms of revenue and players. And, you know, it was just a tiny indie team which created their own derivative of a Pokemon game. Um, and so I think that it's exciting for smaller game development, game development teams like ourselves where, you know, we uh, uh, players aren't just expecting, you know, the best and most amazing looking graphics um, all the time anymore because they realize that, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to be a good game. Um, and, and we've seen that time and time again over the last couple of years where just because something has really nice graphics does not mean it's going to be a good game or fun. And so um, I think it's, it's a really great time for smaller developer teams at the moment to you know capture the attention of you know a, a wide variety of people and i, I mean think, very oh, oh go ahead. sorry but so very good point on that shen and you know i mean everybody's fallen into the trap where you know a new call of duty game comes out you end up buying it you're like oh i'm not gonna buy it and then you get it and you're like okay it's just a reskin of the previous four revisions that have come out I think with like indie developers, since they don't have those metrics that they have to hit, like, you know, if you're working and creating a game for Blizzard, there's metrics that they have to hit, or if they don't hit it, your team gets scrapped. But with the indie developers, I think the fact that they do it for the love of the game rather than, okay, I have to make my CEO happy and we have to hit, you know, $40 million in sales within the first year, they're able to put that a little bit more, you know, love and care into the game. Because every single Call of Duty that has come out within the last four years, the same exact thing. Maybe you can slide on the ground a little bit. But, you know, for example, you look at Pal World, 8 million copies in a week and a half, absolutely insane game. And there's a lot of replayability with it. And then to go even further with the indie developers, um, Battlebit, I think there was two developers on the team and they sold, I think, 12 million copies or something. And it's a low voxel art game. It's just like Battlefield. But they added those it's like you look at the game you look at the characters they're boxy and then you go into like the gun customization which everybody loves in shooters and they hit every single nail on the head and then you go to these triple a titles where they have billions of dollars of backing and again it's okay you can put a new scope on your gun to silencer and that's it so yeah indie developers are the way to go just because of the tender love and care that they can put into the project rather than okay 20 million copies or you're done let me let me ask uh julian julian on that on that note what would you look in a game let's say it's web3 enabled just from your personal perspective what would you look 
uh, into it? Would you look at, at exactly what Stoppy said, you know, like replayability, maybe customizability, and I guess stickiness maybe? is, is and, and what 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 would you look personally for you? Um, I think the, the most relevant thing for me is how frictionless a game is when it comes to do Web3 gaming. Um, you know, I think uh, from, from what I've seen, there's a couple of games that I'm excited about. Um, one of them is called, um, I think it was called the World Wide Web with two Bs. Um, I think maybe now it just moved to web.game. I played around the demo, and I think the whole idea is that um, the NFTs are basically just a way for you to enhance your experience, but they don't necessarily have like a very relevant role within the game itself. Um, and I think, look, if, if your target audience is a lot of crypto users and, and, and you're fine with that and you want to be confined to that environment and you need to you know, force people to connect with their wallets and then pay gas fees whenever they want to buy an item or something, I mean, that's great. Um, but if you're thinking about expanding and you want sort of a broader audience, then I think making it frictionless and then adding a, a layer a sort of Web3 component um, to the game, I think that there's a lot of value in that. That's at least how I, I view it. And, and I completely agree with you know what Shen was talking about and also Sloppy when they talk about sort of AAA games. You know, one of my favorite games of all time is Stardew Valley um, that was built by one single guy. Um, during the course of five years in his basement. I think we all love Stardew Valley. By the way, there's a concert out um, with Stardew Valley music. Um, I encourage you guys to go. It's awesome. I bought my tickets. Um, but anyways, you know, I think simple games like that uh, with a Web3 component that is frictionless, I think for me is um, the, the sweet spot there. Um, yeah, I think that's... Um, that's a, how I view it. I know that there's some other games like, you know, Treeverse back in the day. They were thinking about doing like, you know, the little huts are your NFTs. And that way you can sort of token gate access to certain parts of the world. And that is your own little house. And you have to buy your little Treeverse plot. And that's how you're integrating the NFTs to the game. I think that's a really cool thing, too. I think I guess my, my point is that making it as frictionless as possible is relevant and um, not necessarily allowing sort of the Web three component to to take over to to build around it, right? To try to like make something work that, in theory, is not supposed to to do that, right? And what I'm talking about is like maybe sometimes you know when people drop tokens for that are supposed to be used in in the game for certain things, then it all becomes a, a sort of a pump and dump. I don't want to. Um, name games here, but you know it's happened before, right? And then you start losing control of the currency of the game, and then it's one of those kind of Ponzi-ish things where the more people join, the higher the price of the token, and then when people, when people start leaving, then you know people lose money, and it's all about pursuing the financial component. I feel like I tend to avoid, uh, avoid those games and prefer the ones that have a, m a more soft layer of Web3 that will make it even more fun on top of a game that is already fun. Um, yeah, that's how I think about it. But I, I totally agree. I think I, I, think I, I always hear like a great saying in game development for Web3, and it's like, you know, if you really want your game to succeed in Web3, is like it's got to be fun if there was no crypto or NFT integration whatsoever. And if people would enjoy playing it like that, then you're onto something. But um, otherwise, it's just it's never going to last. On, on that note, I want to give that to Tobias Goose. And take what Julian Chen said. Why why integrating Web three in the first place? Let's say I'm I'm Rockstar Games. I'm gonna drop GTA six. It's gonna be the hottest game. I love it. And wh why why even do Web three stuff? Like why would I get into that? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, right? Why? You know, a lot of people talk about like sort of interoperability between games. It, and you know, maybe I'll throw this question back to the group. Like, has there been like a successful like, uh, sort of, like that, like skins that maybe transfer between games. I haven't seen that because I think the ones I play perhaps don't don't have that. But has there been something that sort of goes across uh, other games? Axie, if it if it's Web three, maybe Axie Infinity 
I think that was what that was like one of the first games that I came across where it wasn't just. I mean, actually, the scholarship program was definitely about the uh, was about the money, but um, you know, the token did did very very well even even when the game kind of was on its way out. Do- Dookie Dash, I would mention too that Martin was uh, talking about. It's really was really good, and they're gonna bring it even back now. Yuga Labs, um, Dookie Dash, open to everyone. Like everyone can play it on on iOS and Android, but the token holders like Board Apes, Mutants, um, the Kennel Club, they are going to have uh, special, you know, stuff unlocked in game. But it's gonna everyone can play it and win prizes and all of this stuff. Like, um, but Dookie Dash definitely was is I would say one of the successful ones in Web3. I would just add to what Bias Goose were saying when it comes to like AAA games. I, I don't think they have proper incentives to take the risk of, of doing something like that, right? Like I think when you think about, um, say Fortnite, for example, right? Like they're, they would prefer to have people just with, you know, not spending all of their money having to buy more tokens to buy another skin than to allow someone to just sell their skin there. And, um, you know, I think it comes to, you know, how for you to have a AAA game, you need a lot of money. Um, and so when there is a lot of money involved and there's investors involved, and so the more mature a company is, the less risk they take, you know, that's the thing. And so you, you can't really innovate that much. That's why, you know, they say that Apple launched one thing, like, or I guess one big thing, right? Like the iPhone. And after that, it was just like, multiple versions of the same thing so i feel like you know someone who's built who's gonna build a triple a game you, you gotta you know you can't take the risk of um you know your your marketplace becoming a bit of a of a shit show with people selling skins at a at a you know um with with money involved i guess maybe one way would be like you know i, I know that the um, the founder of of kraken i think it was uh jesse um he started his career trading items on Diablo, if I'm not mistaken. So he was just like, you know, selling things in the game, but then charging real world money for it, which I thought was pretty awesome, like a way to to add that component there as well. For some reason, I feel like AAA titles, they, they have like a bad taste on monetization of like in-game assets. Like, you know, when Diablo 3 first came out, they had the real world market. And then that it actually turned into like a stock market where people were just like hoarding items, inflating the prices and stuff like that. And then they ended up having to remove it. I, I think there's a way to do it, but I don't know. I feel like AAA titles or, you know, game developers, they're just, they're looking out for the best interests in themselves rather than the actual overall, you know, community rather. Um, to, I will, to, to, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. I was just going to say from like a... One thing that is really positive about building in a game in Web3 from like a small game development team perspective is that um, if you're just building a game in Web2, you're pretty much, unless you're getting external funding, you're not going to be able to create any revenue yourself until the game is completely ready, live and launched. Whereas in Web3 and like, for example, with Zermon, because we were able to, you know, create a game on a smaller scale in Discord and integrate NFTs and create a revenue stream, we're able to create uh, you know, revenue whilst we were developing and use that revenue to then, you know, port over to a web app and hire developers, more developers and animators and things like that. And the only reason we're able to do that is because we were building in Web3 where we're in a position where we can create revenue during the building and development phase. So that is something that you just don't find for indie development teams in, in Web2 for sure. Hey, Goose or Pleb? Well, I mean, after all of these uh, like interventions, I think it's clear that indie is 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 is, is clearly uh, the way to go. I think the, the the other aspect that that I think it's it's important to discuss is how much like it's it's super nice to see that a developer can make money and at least has a better path towards something like that sustainability uh, versus like the the old way. I think that's fascinating. The other question is, what ab- like about the end user? Like a lot of people argue, uh, is it bad like to add like real value incentives versus the traditional way, which was uh, like 
not at all money related. And it really it's linked to Julian's point because I, I, I have nephews that that they're 13 years old and they, they've been like playing a lot and, 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 you know, getting some rare items in these all of these different games. And at the end, what they did was like they asked for a PayPal account to, <laughs> to the parents ended up cashing out and they were like super excited about it and 13 13 years old like making uh <laughs> thousands of dollars I, I, that's also a fascinating thing and, and those people exist and they can be ambitious so it sounds very similar to maybe what uh, jesse powell did i think uh i would love to hear opinions about those two ideas one enabling and going all the way uh, about value or like maintaining like just like the fun aspect as priority number one. I think Martin or Goose, one of you guys were wanted to jump in here. I don't want to take it away. Yeah, it's a it's a tough topic. Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm a young dad. My son is uh, four years old, and we we are you know finishing game after game. Uh, we just finished uh, Mario Wonder just before we finished Elden Ring. And I think the funny thing is that although I'm a, both a, a hardcore gamer by myself, uh, a, a mentor to gamer to my son, and also a NFT degen, uh, it's true that I wouldn't I wouldn't see at all um, almost any value of bringing the the money aspect to, to those games. Uh, typically, the triple A that I play myself. Uh, you know, we talk about the next GTA. Uh, are they going to put crypto in it? I really don't care. Right? Uh, for me, the crypto is a separate realm. Um, I like my games to be, uh, you know, and, and I think that's why maybe it's complicated to crack that equation about Web3 Gaming because we are very polluted by what we play in the real world. And we say, oh, but what about, you know, uh, GTA with coins? Okay, it's simple to say, but I, I think it's very hard to implement in a way that makes sense from a, a fun and gaming perspective. Um, and I think the experience you have on uh, on games, even like Call of Duty, uh, where where people are just like uh, over grinding, and uh, you know when you come as a newcomer, you get uh, washed away, and either you said that you are going to play that game uh, and grind yourself uh, to reach the level where you have maybe a, a kill death of one, either like me, you just say okay, you know, I prefer to go to Fortnite because it's just more fun, more casual, and I don't need to have that uh, competitive mindset. So I don't say that Call of Duty is giving you money for that, but. That idea that in, in games you need to have that huge competition mindset, I think is a bit of a, of a problem. Uh, if we want to keep, again, that gaming experience as fun, as easy, as, you know, uh, you work the whole day, uh, we are all working the whole day, we are all already thinking about money the whole day, do we want to add that extra component when you come back home and just want to chill with, you know, something fancy? Or when you have your toilet break and you play your Candy Crush and whatnot, do you want to have that as well? I think maybe it's an element of stress that us degen traders we like to have in our work, but I'm not sure we like to have it everywhere. And you know, you have like your uh, uh, currency exchange in your brain, trying to uh, swap uh, how many coins you have in uh, this game, this game, this game. Goose, please. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I, th I think there's something like super different about like Web 2 and Web 3 games because Web 2, you know, you're just there to spend money, right? And so do the, the, the games, right? It's just, you, you have no expectation of making money, but in Web 3, there's always, you know, there's always a voice in the back of your head. It's like, well, this could, this could be good. And it's kind of a, like a marketing tool for games, right? If people make money, I mean, you can look at Axie Infinity. They made tons of money. Uh, oh, people made tons of money in the beginning anyway. <laughs> and, you know, you saw what happened later. Um, and a lot of people were saying, like, you know, it's just because the game wasn't that fun, maybe. It was just about the money. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to make it sustainable in Web3, I think. And I'm not really sure the, if the fun is what maintains people. Uh when there is a there is certainly an expectation of making money. Yeah, when we talk about um, Web two and Web three and onboarding, of course, people and all of that stuff, then you know it, it comes to my mind that you know us in the community uh, in crypto uh, is like and and Slopey, I, I I love your take on that. 
I think people outside of crypto, like the streamers, the gamers, all the they hate NFTs. Like they don't like the term. And all it's like when when you say NFTs, like go out of this. Like even though it doesn't make any sense because they would love it, but it has it has some in some weird way a very negative connotation. You know, like it's like oh NFTs. Oh, this is you know something. I don't know, not good. Um, even though this is like the the beauty that Web three games. Um, you know, getting enabled with to create like ownership. Uh, you can trade them. You can do all of this. But there's like I feel like kind of an image problem, and this is why I mentioned um, Rockstar Games and let's say GTA Six. I, I felt like even though, like as Martin said, it wouldn't make maybe a huge difference to us directly because you know you maybe don't play GTA Six or whatever. Um, is it will help maybe the image? You know, like if such a player comes in and gives this like. Uh, more legitimacy, I guess, the whole space as well, coming from, I mean, they're a Web2 giant. Um, that will help. So I'm wondering, Sloppy, what, what is your general, I guess, or Goose, other one of you guys, uh, what is your view on that, like with the image and how other people from Web2 view NFTs? Is it like, ugh, you? I, I honestly think just because it's all about the money, that's probably why like traditional gamers aren't interested in it. Well, just in their point of view, because I mean, when you hear NFT, it's typically related to some sort of monetary value. Um, and then also, when gamers look at it, they want to be able to utilize the NFT and actually do something with it. Um, which, like, I, I think, like Counter Strike, going back to them, they just do it the right way. Like, you can toss that on the blockchain and still have fun with it. But I don't know. I don't know. To me, that's a good question. To me, it feels like it, it's similar to to what happens with like multi sided marketplaces, where you have different people looking for different things. It seems that maybe the goal or like the, the ultimate thing will be okay. NFTs and and, and on chain assets will, will 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 have value as long as as they can be traded. So they will be traded, and there will be people who focus on that. And that will be like one role of, 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 of the game. And there will be other roles of people who they're just users. And right now, maybe there aren't many people trying different models. It reminds me, like, I don't know if you guys tried, like, one of the first games that emerged in the, in the Polygon world. Well, at least for me, was like the set run, which is like these horses. What is interesting is that people were like, we're breeding those, those horses and and, and and obviously, like th there was a game in in the breeding aspect that you know, depending on on you know like who, who were like the two parents, like there was a, th a thing very similar to to the other NFTs with doing breeding, but that but it didn't stop there. So after that, the the whole point it was like a race game, and then people were interested about like just the 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 racing and and, and things like that, and. And also, like, they were, like, visually interesting. So I, there was opportunities for maybe other people to just do, like, maybe advertising or things like that. So in a way, I feel like in the future, multiple people may, may come to the games for different reasons. And maybe that's the way that things will, uh, like, balance. Uh, and, and, and I haven't seen that. Uh, maybe we're going to get to that point. But in my opinion, like, there's not going to be something like, oh, this is just for the fun. As long as there's value, like... Uh, we will have different actors. Yeah, I, and I mean, to... oh, I'll, I'll just quickly, yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah, like, I totally agree. Um, and, like, even within the Zertmon community already, like, we've definitely got a divide between players who, um, you know, play the game purely for fun and they don't even think about anything to do with cost. And we've got some players who play because they want to try and make money from it and all of that. And I think that just any Web3 game is always going to have a variety of those sort of players. So it's about creating something that, um, you know, caters well to all, I think. Jump in, Julian. Oh, I was just going to add on to that. Um, I think there's also, and I think we shouldn't forget that there's, there are multiple examples of Web2 games that, you know, people ended up just buying and selling assets and it became a bit of a, of a shit show situation. I'm not sure if you guys have ever played um, good old RuneScape. Um, I'm not sure how old you guys are, but RuneScape is, a, is an amazing MMO and... It's really funny because there's uh, 
Planet Money episode, uh, which is like a podcast, and then apparently the game has turned into like some really sort of weird um, sort of real life war in which you know I'm not sure how much you guys know about Venezuela, but Venezuela is a, you know has become a very poor country, and so people in Venezuela started playing RuneScape and selling the gold um, to make money because that paid for you know their life more than a normal job in the country and so you had a lot of people in venezuela that were just like mining the gold mines and it became like a huge sort of venezuelan gang that was controlling the gold in runescape so no one could mine gold <laughs> <laughs> so it was so funny because people were just trying to like go to the mines and like because you can kill other players like the venezuelans would kill them because they were actually fighting for their lives uh, to control the supply of gold in the game, and that kind of like ruined it, right? Because then suddenly, like you couldn't, uh, you couldn't buy your items, you couldn't do anything because there was a, uh, there were a bunch of people controlling the game. So I thought it's hilarious. If you guys can look it up, uh, I think it's on NPR or something. And, uh, it's Planet Money, and then it's it's a show about RuneScape. It's really funny. I I, I forgot the um, the exact server, but. Me and Monkey actually, we played a while. Uh, it was it was during the Zerbcraft, um era, and you know a lot of people know this was like it was a uh, Wave One Grantia thing. He they did a really amazing uh, integration with uh, what was it Minecraft, and a lot of people played that. But during that time, me and Monkey were playing also in other servers that were very similar that you described, Julian, where it was like. Uh, you go into the servers and they had like the, this real economy, okay, like with Minecraft. And you could, there's a marketplace in the middle and people would just, you know, go farming, come back. And, and I mean, it's just crazy. And they can then exchange it, I think, for real money too. So people will make like, money or, you know, as you mentioned, in, in countries where, you know, third world countries, they, they can make their living out of it. I mean, we have seen this with Axie Infinity as well. Um, which is which is really, I mean, it's astonishing because it, it shows you the possibilities, right? It shows you the possibilities and where this could go, and it kind of moved also from this plur- uh, play to earn to play and earn. So a lot of people play, like Shen said, you know, some people do this and that. Like you play and you can earn, and then you can do all of that stuff. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of a delicate balance, right? Because you have these people trying to make money there and you also you know for them to make money you also have to have money coming in so you have to have people willing to spend their money and yeah it's kind of a it it requires some like pretty complex planning i think to keep that sustainable at least but in a way the odd thing is that when we talk about web3 gaming we are all always discussing about uh, money first and only and we don't really take into account the fact that NFTs in particular, they have uh, way further and more advanced properties, I think, that could be used. So, for example, the fact that, you know, uh, you could be incentivized to keep almost like staking function. You know, you could keep your NFT as long as possible and be rewarded for that as an early backer, for example, of a project. Because uh, I think we are always focusing on that very short term hyper-liquid world, which is actually not really NFT, it's, it's the opposite, it's, it's very fungible, right? Um, but when you come to those collections, even Zupman, when you have like, a, uh, I'm not sure how many Zupman there are there, but you have different levels of rarities and so on, I don't see those special traits and aspects of the NFTs uh, being, you know, often at the center of the gaming experience without uh, even talking about the money. And I think what Zupman, actually, you, you guys are doing quite well is that the, the monetary incentives, I would say, on Zepman, they are quite minimal, uh, I would say. Uh, you have like a half a XRP here, half a Zerp there. Um, so clearly, you can make money if you want, uh, but it's not put up front as uh, a way that, you know, you can uh, casino gamble your life here and, you know, like Axe Infinity and those guys, uh, you know, uh, uh, kill, kill yourself to it, but you have a, a few more coins. Um, I'm just wondering, yes, if we... As you know, NFT DJs are aware of that. When I entered NFT space in 2021, uh, the rarity system was really something that, wow, people would uh, be keen to pay more for special traits and so on. And now with all, you know, the zero, zero royalty environment, blur, uh, points and so on, we have uh, fungified in a way that beautiful non-fungible environment. 
And I think it's also something that maybe we could come back to to, to create new experiences on uh, length of duration, uh, duration that you, you keep an NFT, rarity, combination of traits that would not be only about the coins, but really about more attributes of the NFT itself. But but Mantra, I, I I just want to go right in this. Like, let's go dig right in, right into this. Isn't this also like kind of the issue with our in general crypto audience in the NFT space that people want to like? Where's the utility? Can I get rich? Like, where's the price and all of that stuff? Where you get immediately bombarded almost with all of these expectations towards, let's say, someone who is creating a game uh, with you know like all these questions like, hey, can I do th th this and that? Even though you know it shouldn't be a focus, but it kind of is the, the curse of the current audience that you, I guess, initially attract that is all about, hey, you know, what I said, where's the utility, where's the money, where's this and that? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's one reason why uh, Web2 gamers hate NFTs. Because I think, exactly. uh, that <laughs> in, in a way, you skew the games uh, and you create a lot of biases because if you have a, a bigger bag of coins, you can make your way to the top, right? And when you watch streamers, the top streamers, you watch them and they are proud because they have spent, I mean, insane amount of hours to build the skill. Not They, they don't take the shortcut of, I have... Uh, the most amount of app coins, or uh, anyway, whatever you do, I can just like you know uh, be at the <laughs> number one at the finish line, and that's it. So I think that's why we the, the problem is that now the Web3 industry is really reduced to coins, coins, and coins. Um, and I think it's uh, yeah for people who have bought, of course, NFTs expensively is going to matter uh, hugely if they can make money out of it. Um, it's a tough environment. Maybe there should be a way that, you know, when uh, you buy an NFT, uh, you are not uh, allowed to sell it for, I don't know, two years, three years, uh, the duration that the game development reaches some form of maturity. Actually, there is a small parallel, I think, with the stock market. So I'm French. Um, and in France, we start to have laws whereby to stop or prevent people from gambling heavily on stocks. Uh, they get tax incentives if they hold it for, I think, more than five years. Basically, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the benefits that they can make out of the, of the stock selling will be uh, offset. There's uh, almost no tax. And if you sell it the first year, you have a, a crazy tax because you are basically here for gambling. You don't care about the company doing this or that. You just want to, to flip that stock to the next you know, uh, bigger fool. So those are the kind of things that you know, could also come into play. Um, NFTs, they are super malleable. You can tell, you know, you can instruct them to do exactly what you want as a publisher. But I don't think I've seen a lot of that for the moment. I have something for you, Shen, um, or f for you, Pleb. So let's, I think, let's start. With, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just adding to that, I think it's an excellent point. I think just uh, in order for, for, for games to be interesting, like all of the rarities and, and, and those type of things uh, need to be revived. I, I don't think that world is completely dead. I mean, you can see like there are communities that maintain those values still. Like, I mean, maybe it's it's a minority, but like outside of like these like big uh, marketplaces that are trying to do like high frequency trading, you still have communities like the punks and things like that that they 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 are like almost like willing to never sell, even like so that they became irrational in a way, right? They would never sell one specific um, NFT just because it's a. Uh, for them, it's like values infinite, and I think that that if you combine those aspects with with gaming, like the poss the possibilities are endless. I think like the, the the first step to move towards that direction is like to have the right primitives. Because for me, when I enter like the NFT world, for me like the 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 tools that that were about like finding out rarities for me are really important when 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 you're selecting like which which uh, NFT within a collection to buy. And those, yeah, more and more, like the trend is like, even like those websites uh, are not anymore like offering that service or are focusing on other things because it was maybe, uh, it's not right now, like the, the, the trend, the thing, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, let's take it right there. And I will probably give that to, to Shen um, to, let's move to the XRP ledger side of things. So, you know, I would start with saying, you know, for the XRP ledger, I said this all the time, like, for me, it's like really ideal for NFTs. You know, we have fast block times. It's super cheap. It's secure because the NFTs are on a layer one. 
and we have a built-in DAX that you can trade it with. There is, uh, you know, we have royalties enforced on the ledger, and so overall, really good properties and nice, uh, nice things that, uh, you know, really desirable for NFTs and therefore also Web3 gaming. So, Shen, I would like to ask you, what kind of challenges um, or even opportunities you are seeing with the XRP ledger currently with gaming uh, or Web3 gaming uh, and the XRPL? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's both like definitely upsides and challenges, of course. Um, as you mentioned, a few of those those reasons are you know why why Web3 gaming and NF- NFTs are are great on the mainnet. Um, you know, I think some of the obvious challenges are things like you know lack of smart contract functionality, which means we can you know do a little bit less with the NFTs themselves. But what I think is really exciting is um, the exchain bridge amendment, um, because what I think it could create is a really seamless multi-chain environment, which is also really great for games and gaming. And um, like for example, something we're working on with Zertmon is we want <clears throat> to create an ecosystem where players don't feel like they're locked to a specific chain. So we're, we're allowing the login of multiple wallets across multiple chains, the you know the mainnet, EVM chains, EVM side chain, things like that. And for a player to you know hold various NFTs on different wallets across different chains and for them to log in with multiple wallets and aggregate all of those NFTs and play with all of them at the same time. And I think that that's something which will be really exciting for once we've got the exchange bridge out and people are able to move across these different chains. It also means for us game development teams is that we're able to use the unique benefits of all of these different chains within one single game. And I think that that's something that's very exciting about the XRPL and the you know the sort of uh, sidechain ecosystem which I think is about to about to um, happen with the exchange bridge amendment. Well, um, I'm I'm curious. I have I have a question on that. Um, for you, Shen, like, what are some of the things, you, know, you don't have to give all the alpha, obviously I'm asking you, but what are some of the things that you're trying to bring <laughs> into the game? By Goose trying to get me fucking leaking everything? Yeah, <laughs> almost slipping. <laughs> trying to put my bags here. <laughs> um, so, did you did you ask what are some of the things coming to the game? Yeah, what, what do you feel like the, the, the side chains will, will be able to bring into the game like what's what's like something that you've been wanting to bring into the game they have been able to okay sure well i've got a really great example of this actually um so one of the one of the sort of double-edged sword um things that we've found with zermon over recently is you know the the zermon nfts sit at a very high floor price and you know that that is testament to the strength of the zermon community and the player base which is really great to see but it's also means it's more difficult for new players to get involved because there's quite a large upfront investment if they want to start you know owning their own zermon to level it up and things like that so what we really wanted to do was look at a way of how can we integrate you know, a a version of the Zermon and Zermon NFTs that, you know, allow players to get in and get involved at a much cheaper price point, but without devaluing the existing released NFTs. And so something we wanted to release was uh, what we're calling Starter Zermon. And essentially the idea behind them is that they're at a much, much cheaper price point and you'll get to pick which one out of the 20 different starting types. And it'll actually be a non-transferable NFT at first when you buy it. So you have to play with it for a certain amount of time and reach a certain amount of milestones with that NFT. And then you'll get the decision to be able to evolve it or to Uh, turn it into a transferable version which you can now trade yourself and you'll have that decision twice for each evolution and that was something that we really wanted to do for a while now but we found it difficult to do in a seamless way for the user on the on the mainnet because it would have had to require you know the burning and reminting of nfts multiple times um because of the you know the non-transferable flag and things like that so you know, the thing like an EVM sidechain allows us to use smart contracts to pretty much fulfill this mechanism all within a single NFT without having to do any burning and reminting. So that's something that we're really excited about the EVM sidechain is because we can we can launch a mechanism like this on the EVM chain and using the X-chain bridge, people are then able to move between the main and the sidechain very easily with, you know, all of these NFTs. And the exchange bridge is only, as far as I know, for tokens, right? It's not for uh, NFTs yet or something like that. Is that correct? 
I'm pretty I'm pretty certain, but I'm still asking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Julian? I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think the crushing bridge is only fungible tokens, but um, I was wondering if, uh, Shen, you, you know, Adam from the cafe usually talks about um, the potential of sort of connecting NFTs on mainnet with smart contracts on the EVM. So I know that at a high level he was talking about Imagine minting um, NFTs on mainnet that the the URI is pointing towards some um, EVM sidechain smart contract, and then maybe at some point you're able to just you know if you if you prove ownership of a certain wallet on mainnet that you can call some some functions on the smart contract, and then um, there's like that smooth interoperability between mainnet and EVM, but it's frictionless, and you know you don't really notice that you're using both chains. Is that something that you guys ever considered or are open to exploring or yeah, definitely. would love to I, I've learn actually, a little more? Yeah, I've actually I've talked to Adam about that same thing before and we've had that discussion and um, yeah, I think that that's going to be a really great use case for NFTs on the on the EVM sidechain and, and you know, yeah, not just for gaming, for, for various different use cases. It, it provides a lot of opportunity there, which I think is great. Um, and yeah, and I know there's, you know, there's teams like, I, I'm, there's teams like the uh, you know the Futureverse team, which are building an an NFT bridge between Root Network and XRP on Mainnet, and you know I'd assume that they'll probably eventually integrate the EVM sidechain as well. So uh, I think that there are a lot of teams, you know, building these sort of mechanisms to create a seamless ecosystem between all of these sidechains. You know, I know Mao Finance as well. They're they're going to be integrating the the uh, exchange bridge to try and you know uh, create a multi-chain bridge between all these chains. So I think that that's that's what's really I think is going to be powerful for not just gaming but all you know tokens and NFTs and stuff for the XRPL ecosystem is you know being able to move between all these different chains which have different unique capabilities. I I would like to ask Sloppy. I don't know if you're available, but yeah, I would like I like to ask Sloppy because he he loves cross chain. I feel like this is where things are right now moving, that IP and all of this is, is multi-chain, and it's like wherever you're going, it's like you can have it wherever you like. Like, let's say if we take the XRPL ecosystem, EVM sidechain, mainnet, root network, and so on, and you can just have it basically where you want to have it, but and you can move it around, and this is much better in terms of your flexibility. Uh, what you want to use, but is the community in that regard? Is the community ready for multi-chain NFT IP? I guess. Uh, I think I think the perspective has changed a lot over the last year, and people are a lot more open to the idea of multi-chain. And I mean, you look at like how, how much Solana has done over the last you know couple months even as well. It's like people are way more open to it now than ever, I think. So, um, you know, I, I think it just doesn't make sense for people to think that, you know, it's one chain to rule them all really. Like it, it, people have come to realize it, it makes no sense at this point. Thanks for jumping in, Chen. I think Sloppy is uh, somewhere stuck. No, no, I'm mobile right now. Um, I, I <laughs> now you're coming in. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know. I have, I have my, I have my AirPods in, but my manager just showed up. But so you I, just ignored I, me. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. I'm walking around San Francisco right now. Um, nice. There's, uh, I'm paying attention. I'm trying to stay, trying to stay as safe as possible. I'm trying to stay as safe as possible. <laughs> <laughs> San Francisco is safe. I think so, at least. Yeah, it's pretty good. Not for it's... Europeans, Matt, but for the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> all America is not safe for Europeans. It's, it's for America. For America, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but to bring it back to the XRP Ledger and... Um, gaming nfts so that the, the technical hurdles i guess and that you can overcome with um being uh, multi-chain like the ebm sidechain utilizing all these uh, the strength of every chain 
uh, you know, you have to main chain super liquid and you can, you know, have the best liquidity there and you can use smart contract functionality uh, on the EVM sidechain then. Um, all of this. But is there is there something, I guess you would say, also community-wise, so not only from a technical hurdle, but community-wise that you see um, you, you would like to attract more now that you are, you can say you are very early here on the ledger? Maybe more um, degens, less <laughs> degens. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what it needs. I think one of the areas I'm really excited about is the the Asian markets, um, and I think particularly for the XRPL because you know there's such a large amount of XRP holder base in places like Korea and Japan, and I think a lot of them struggle to engage in the current XRPL ecosystem just due to the you know mainly due to lack of uh, you know uh, cross language support and things like that, um, and I think that it's really important for the XRPL to look at these other non-English speaking audiences if it wants to, um, you know, properly grow. And I, I think that there's, especially when it comes to gaming, is that that's, that's where the Asian markets, I think, will really thrive because, you know, it's, it's something that's so ingrained in the culture over there. And, you know, I, I, we've even seen on Cafe, you know, so many Japanese creators over the last year have come on board and started creating and releasing content. And, the, um, yeah, you go. Yeah, the, they they are actually they are right now our largest uh, user base like by far um, yeah exactly after United States like first it was United States but yeah the the takeover happened a couple months ago and now it's like really it, like Japan of course South Korea you mentioned huge markets for for the XRP community and. Yeah, now I, I haven't seen many people like actively targeting them, like projects here. I think we should do this definitely more because it feels like it's the low hanging fruit for us. Um, and you mentioned um, language support. That is, I mean, language barrier is is, is always the thing in, in Asia. So that is that should be a big uh, to do for, in my opinion, every project um, having that language support. And then targeting those um, regions uh, and communities more because there's a lot of growth opportunity that is not tapped uh, enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and XRP is already like so uh, popular in Japan anyway. It's uh, it's kind of an easy bridge just to bring them into to your project. I think that's one of the challenges of the XRPL, right? It's like there's a ton of people who hold XRP, but you got to like, you gotta have something good for them to use it. Exactly. Yeah. If you, you gotta give them a good reason to um, to to use it because you built something good. Yeah, I think XRP especially too. Like people are like, some people believe in XRP so hard that like you really gotta give them a good reason to spend it in something. Uh, so yeah, it's a. It's certainly a challenge. I actually saw a tweet today. And I don't even know who it was, but it was yeah, it was saying exactly that. It was like, it's it's hard for people to want to spend their XRP, and but look, I mean, people are doing it, right? Cafe is doing it. Shan is doing it. So there there is a way, and I think yeah, I think you guys are doing amazing in terms of like community building. I yeah, it's like unparalleled. You guys are are doing amazing. Appreciate it. And I think, honestly, this is right now really the current, in my opinion, growing momentum. A lot of people in the community, XRP, in a general XRP community, are more aware of the builders, more aware of the projects, more interested in it. Where, like, I can remember, like, two years ago, 2021, it was so hard to get even visibility. Um, or, you know, in, especially in 2022, because there was, like, you know, deep bear market um, in general. It was hard to get visibility, and now I feel like it's more, more, more easier because people just realize, like, hey, like there's much more going on here on the XRP ledger, and the 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 projects are maturing too. You know, in the beginning we had maybe a lot of small attempts, but now a lot of the projects, I, I gotta really say, they're maturing, and like the whole community is doing a great job building really, really nice projects. Um, obviously, we need more of it. <laughs> we need obviously more of it. Um, and, and even more, you know, collab, collab, basically, collaborations with other chains, projects from other chains, um, but even within the community, because, you know, together we are stronger. 
Um, and I, I deeply, I deeply convinced that other chains, they are, they, they are opportunists, you know, they are not really, I, I really came to this realization. They're opportunists. They don't, I mean, there are of course people who are really married to their chain, but a lot of people are opportunists. They look for good opportunities. They look for good projects where they can partake. And I think this is where our opportunity is as well. So Shen, are, are you yeah. gonna, yeah, go, go ahead, Goose. No, sorry, I was gonna say like, uh, you know, the, once there is incentive to for people to come here, and I know it's, you know, a bit against uh, the motto, no incentive is the best incentive, but you know, I do think- uh, <laughs> Don't open that can of- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's not go there, go, go. <laughs> XRP staking, when? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're about shit. to be cancelled here <laughs> yeah but I mean I don't want to go there but honestly staking and all of this stuff like, there's is there I would love to hear from you guys is there really a direct correlation between that and a successful project I feel like it's more the other way around like people see successful projects then they look at oh what is the underlying chain oh it has staking Oh, it must be because of staking. I think it's just the correlation is is other way around. Like good project make a good chain, and not necessarily. You know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, no. I, yeah, I think. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think. I, honestly, I don't think people care about which chain. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, I think people are actually like, if you have, for example, like a big project. Say you know, there's like a big project on Solana today. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. Uh, you know, so, like, it's not gonna I mean, I don't know if it's going to happen, right? But like, they're mm -hmm. going to move to the XRPL. I think people are more loyal to the projects themselves than, than the chain. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially I think, when I look at... Oh, go ahead, Julian, sorry. Oh, no, I mean, I was just going to say uh, that I think there was an amendment um, that was out to allow escrow of IOUs, if I'm not mistaken, right? I feel like oh, yeah. that would be... You know, like an like an interesting thing, because at the end of the day, I guess the idea of of this whole staking thing is just to remove tokens out of circulation, which you know, in theory, I guess should push the price of the token up, and then everyone is happy, kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> when sometimes a team is like dumping on you, I'm not talking. I'm talking about like projects <laughs> and other chains, right? Which kind of sucks, but um, if well done, you know, it is like, and the team is well funded. It's not they're not selling tokens to survive, right? Like. Um, I think potentially allowing the escrow of of IOUs is a way of doing like something similar to staking, right? So in theory, I think if you're a project, then you can just keep track of, you know, who has escrow which tokens, and then that can be considered sort of some sort of staking situation, um, mm -hmm. and then you can just airdrop tokens to them. I mean, I, I don't think it would be as decentralized as it would be with like a like a smart contract on Ethereum, but um, because you have to be manually rewarding users, but um, I think it's it's a way and it could be done. Yeah, it gets close to that, and especially we can prove that. Yeah, I indeed locked up my IOU tokens, and I cannot access them because you know the, the chain is is really locking them. Yeah, one thing you know, like you mentioned the amendment, and I think that we have a barrage of amendments that are really going to help with this, like. Um, even the XLS, is it 56? Yeah, 56 with the batch transaction one. I'm really looking forward to this because you can you can have like fees and other stuff added together in, in one atomically. And that itself, right, is such a huge leap forward in my opinion for, I would say definitely Web3 gaming, but in general, um, NFTs and everything on Ledger. So I'm looking really forward to that too. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a huge one for me personally. Yeah, I think that's that's one thing that I'm looking for the most. I think this year, uh, you know, as as long as it, it goes forward, because uh, yeah, to have builders, you gotta. I don't want to go to incentives again. Let's <laughs> let's give that. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, help them make, help them make money. You know. Right. Uh, exactly. Just in a more seamless way. Uh, just yeah, fees for services and, and stuff like that. I think it's yeah. 
as long as you have an easier way to make money, it's easier to, to bring builders. Yeah, that uh, that amendment, I think it really helps the cafe, right? That um, so you don't have to access fifty six. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is one of the things. Yeah, it would definitely help us uh, with other stuff, but the this is like the unique thing with NFTs on XRP Ledger. It has like this broker mode in, in built in, which allows you to take a fee out of that transaction that you provided, you know, on your platform. Um, so in that aspect, it's really unique. So for the NFT people, that's that's really great, and um, we haven't seen this on, on for you know let's say IU tokens or something like this. I mean, there is a transfer fee you have there, but it's not the same, not the same. And in my opinion, it would help yeah tremendously also us because you have like the minting part, yeah minting, then you create an offer that they accept it and all of this. So you know you can you can really circumvent a lot of stuff with that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And something that is going to be going live very, very soon, actually, is you know the automated market maker. I think this is overlooked, like yeah, maybe in this um, context, but it's huge. Why is it huge? Like we looked at it as well for um, onboarding uh, on ramps through um, stable coins. So that people can, you know, on pay with Apple Pay, get stable coin, and then they can choose when they want to exchange that for XRP or something on Dex. But we have seen that, you know, the spread on Dex is huge because, you know, we don't have an automated market maker. So people were getting like a cut of 10, 15 percent. It was like, oh no, this is ridiculous. We cannot offer this to people uh, when they get like constantly 10, 15 percent spread <laughs> in their face. So we did hold off on that idea, and we were really look hope to look into that back when the automated market maker I think next week is going to be enabled um, and to see like that dynamic play out uh, now with hopefully a good functioning market maker on chain and how that will help with liquidity because this is like also something that plays into web3 gaming nfts all that looking forward yeah that's really cool we're really gonna have to keep the atom Locked in the cage, huh? Oh yeah, he's down there. He's already locked. Uh, not not gonna come out of that. That's why he's not speaking. He's too busy working. He's in the dungeon right now. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, Shen, if you have something else to chime in here, it was a really great convo. Yeah, for sure. Um. Not really much else. I, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier today was, yeah, your thoughts on how the NFT ecosystem has changed and evolved and progressed from launch in terms of, you know, metrics you've seen on cafe and things like that. Yeah, I will let, definitely let Adam speak about the metrics now that he's up here. But let me tell you that about how it evolved. What I really like is... Um, you know, we talk to a lot of people from other chains, and it really helps that in the beginning we had a lot of derivatives. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, we can hear you. And now, please don't talk over me, else I'm gonna demote you. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, so we we have seen, <laughs> he's not even listening probably. <laughs> but yeah, so we have seen a lot of derivatives right in the beginning. And I'm really, really happy to see now more and more original stuff, original art, like organic communities being built out. Because this is essentially really what you pitch to other communities when they look at what's going on here, right? They, they take a look at, okay, what are some projects here? And if, if, of course, everything is just a copy, right, from other chains, like, okay, you know, it's like, why, why do you guys do that? And I'm really, really happy to see that this is kind of sorted out and we see more and more original art, original communities, people experimenting also with stuff like i like the the ragsy drop for example when when she did like the gamified uh version on her web page and then you get the drop and all that for, for her nfts um i i like that stuff we see smaller drops like uh, you know collections 100 to 500 nft size which is very very similar to the ordinal space if people know like usually there are smaller sized uh, drops because of the cost 
but it just makes sense here too because of the audience. Um, so I'm seeing I'm seeing it evolving really, really great. More, 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 more from this. Um, but I also see that a lot of projects definitely looking more to collab and and uh, reach out to other people so that they can take the next level. You know what I mean? Take the next level. Maybe starting to commercialize their project, looking at all of this and how they can dedicate more time to their project and community so they can, you know, make it more successful. I think this is right now the evolution we are in. Um, so I'm looking definitely forward to how, how this will be doing. But so far, I'm actually really happy that we sorted first the, the derivatives out because <laughs> it's, it's a hard sell, you know, speaking to other chains. Um, yeah. Um, I see Adam dropped. Um, I I swear I did not drop him. This was not me. Uh, no, nah, he come back. <laughs> nah, he told okay. me that he can't hear anything when he goes up to speaker. Apparently. Oh yeah, he he, he can drop and come back, and uh, I would love to hear his take. Yeah. Yeah, the the gaming kind of uh, environment of the XRPL has changed a lot. Cause I remember a couple of years ago, people were really excited about Zerpcraft. Right. You know, if, we, if we talked about that, I, I, yeah, I think I, as soon as I joined Ripple, I think that came out very shortly after. I remember playing that with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Crypto Survivor, Crypto Miles. Those, yeah, those guys. Are cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was a really, I mean, it was a really great game, and it was super awesome. Integrate into an, a very, <laughs> obviously, very popular game uh, already, which is Minecraft. So that's that, that was an easy one, um, but but to see this coming back and and honestly, Shen, I think it was really with you, you know, like when when this was like blowing up, you know, your Discord and you said we're like saying, hey, you know, we're outgrowing our Discord, we need to do more stuff now. Now we have to Web three, uh, sorry, the website, um, the web app, sorry, web app, and um, that gave it more light because. This is something among Web3 and NFTs that is uh, really, really important, you know, like Web3 Gaming to have that asset also in the portfolio um, as, as a chain, you know, as a community to say, hey, we have also these people here. And speaking of the devil, we have uh, Adam up here. Um, now, can you hear oh my us? God. Adam? Can, you can you finally hear me? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can yeah, hear you. Yeah. 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 I've, I've been rugging like this whole time. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, Elon rugged your uh, Starlink. Yeah, Adam. So we were know, talking right? about. Yeah, we were talking about you know Web three gaming NFTs and all of this, and it was a really nice conversation. And we'd love actually to hear from you. Um, could you can you share some some stats how NFTs on XRP Ledger have evolved? Maybe some current stats or something that you have on hand uh, for Cafe or General Ledger. Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, I would I don't say know like, where you like, are right now. like General Ledger. I, I think we're close to. Um, Getting close to like thirty four thousand wallets that have like an NFT in it, um, and that's that's kind of been growing steadily just this whole past year. And um, even if people don't kind of see it like volume wise, um, the NFT space is definitely growing. And I I see like you know project like Zerpon, you see kind of that that growth in terms of like the community aspect and everything. But um, I, what I was going to say earlier was that. Um, you know, there's a really interesting like value proposition that I'm seeing, and with this convergence of different tech, like the you know the Apple Vision Pro that just came out like a few days ago, and it's kind of changing everything in terms of like productivity to like, um, and I see that becoming like really big into games. So like, you kind of see this convergence of tech between um, like augmented reality, and I and I can see you know there being like digital items with nft backing with even if it's just a primitive case of just you know verifying authenticity and stuff and, and then you know combining that with like my, my kids like really big into like pokemon cards right and having these digital items that um have some sort of like augmented uh reality component built into them like that couples with the vision pro so you know like it's it's kind of a you know an evolving thing and i see you know the web two gaming and web three gaming, they're not separate pieces, but um, kind of they're going to converge and there's going to be multiple different solutions, you know, for everything.
And what's better than, you know, uh, the blockchain that has some legal clarity, so. Exactly, Goose. But by, by the way, uh, Adam, I want to hear, wh what are your, because you mentioned Pokemon, what is your favorite starter? My favorite starter? I have, honestly, I have no idea about Pokemon. I'd, I'd have to ask my, my six-year-old, because he has like a whole deck of Pokemon cards, and I'm like, completely <laughs> clueless on it. All right, all right, you're going to take that, you're going to take that. <laughs> Something something fun on that note that we're actually working on is we're um we're turning all of the all of the first thousand Zertmon into a um, TCG and we're creating um booster packs and things like that and the you'll be able to you know uh, buy a booster pack and then you know have a little QR code get some in-game items as well and essentially we want to create a full TCG very simplified card game that anyone can pick up and play that has you know no Web three crypto integration at all um, and I think that breaking into those sort of areas. As we were talking about Pudgy Penguins as well, they've done a very similar thing, and I, I think that's very much the way to go for, for games in the future. I want to make yeah, sure to buy one of those from my kid. <laughs> he's he's going to be so into that. Yeah, we've got plushies coming as well, so we can send him one of those. By the way, I have a question for you, Shen, too, and on that note, um, are there any conferences this year you, you're you going to attend, maybe you want to share, because I'm curious where you're going to be and talk about, you know, XOPL gaming, uh, maybe there are dedicated gaming conferences, something like this, so we will be curious to hear. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm planning on going to uh, a fair few this year. Um, the first one we'll be at is Waves of Innovation uh, on the Gold Coast in a couple months. And um, we have a Zertmon booth there and we'll, you know, I ideally we're on track to have the full release of the game um, with all gameplay capabilities done by then. And so we'll be able to have a booth where people can come up and battle each other in front of each other and look at all our merchandise and, you know, the, the, t the cards and stuff should all be done by then. So we'll be at that with the booth um and then i'll obviously be at apex as well which i'm very excited Heck yeah for. yeah yeah very excited for that should be good and then I, i'd really like to um yeah check out a lot more of the you know non xrpl conferences such as um ACC and um dev connect and things like that um because i think it's it'd be really good for visibility of the xrpl and xrpl projects mm -hmm. to you know have more have more um you know spaces there and and be able to you know properly like ex you know talk to these to these cross chain people and, and explain what we've got going on and you know not just leave it to the influencers on Twitter. Um, and I think <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really important. Yeah, and and the other I, I think as well some of the Asian conferences such as Korea Blockchain Week and things like that is would be really good for the XRPL because that's that's where you know as we we're talking about before there's such a large yeah. XRP community there and and especially gaming community as well as yeah I, I think that that'll be really exciting. On that note, like I see a lot of people in the audience, you should definitely come to Apex. Like, if you if you miss out this year, then I mean, you 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 definitely missed out. But uh, definitely come to Apex. It's going to be in Amsterdam, June eleventh to thirteenth, I think. Yeah, and um, it's going to be great. It's not only for devs because people are like, ah, oh, no, I'm not going to come in. It's just for devs. No, it's not only for devs. If you're a dev, of course come, <laughs> but if you're not a dev, you will not be lost there, I guarantee you. So definitely come there too. Um, and by the way, Shane, I really like, this goes also what Adam also really likes, uh, is being present at non-XRPL or XRP conferences, having more presence there so that people know like there is we're doing something here um, out of our echo chamber. I think this is really valuable. And, yeah, I um, think so. Because like yeah. most of these people from other chains, all they hear about of the XRPL is from things like Twitter and things like that. And you know, we we know yeah. we know that how much misinformation and things like that is all just spread about the XRPL and XRP across, you know, across things like Twitter and stuff. So I think being present with you know the real builders being present and the real teams being present at these events and able to you know talk to these people and show them what is actually being built, that's what's going to really you know shift the the opinion of the the other chains. I think. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree with that. Um, and, yeah, and and of course to correct the narrative that it's you know it's the XRP ledger, right? The, the classic XRP Ripple thing. I mean, I I was at with Adam in a call, 
and we talked to some other people and they were like yeah and so this is the ripple nft and ripple now it's like this is the, there's the ripple nft it's the xrp the xrp nft the xrp l chain the ledger uh, all that stuff so it's there's a lot of education coming into this but we need to first have the opportunity to do this so this is why these um, conferences are so important and i encourage everyone honestly to attend those like even your local ones show up um and you know represent the xrpl community i think we all would love to support you uh as always and um or, or connect with people who are going to conferences and maybe you can you know give them some merch or whatever you have um you know people usually at conferences they love merch and you know what, what better opportunity you have to leave an, uh, an impression there um with with some some merch or whatever you have that's cool but yeah, um, so but we we at Ripple will be at ETH Denver. Um, nice. Are you guys going to be there? Um, yeah, we're going to be there. Um, Adam is going to be there. Um, is Two Cakes down there? Yeah, Two Cakes is down there. Two Cakes Sweet. is also going to be there. So, yeah. Awesome. And of course, so we're going to show. To... Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, I say, yeah, we Cafe is going to be there. I'm trying to. Uh, I wanted to get a proper extra P Ledger t shirt because. I don't want to go as, you know, I want to, of course, like we are from Ripple, <laughs> but we also want to uh, start sort of, you know, uh, helping people not confuse things. So something like build on XRP Ledger kind of a thing. Um, but I think the, the foundation gave us some, but I think they can be a little um, provocative sometimes for an ETH conference so maybe something mm -hmm. more like build on XRP kind of a thing uh, will be really cool so if you guys have any ideas let me know that sounds beautiful that's, that's I think that, that's, that is much better I think it would be you know especially for an ETH conference like having something like build on XRP versus like a Ripple massive logo walking around I also you know I want to get out of there alive so um, I feel like it could be a good... Uh, yeah, it, it's the Lions then, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll yeah. take one for the team. I'll be there and I'll let them slap me and whatever, right? Like, that's what I'm here <laughs> for. I, it's fine because th there was a conference here um, and I was there with uh, David Bacheri uh, from Comments and I did have the workshop there. And it was like a full ETH. Uh, it's a small local one, but it was, it was a full ETH um, conference and a lot of people whether from you know only ethereum and like some really interesting conversations there like uh, people were really surprised about what we have like if you if you if you manage to get good conversations with the hardcore eat folks you will you will be surprised how um yeah open they're going to be about you know the xp ledger and all that um, but yeah you have yeah, we, to also the the weirdos <laughs> Yeah, we. I mean, we had a lot of really great conversation when we went to Consensus last year, and there was, you know, a lot of like really hardcore like EVM and, um, you know, ETH folks there, and I, you know, we we never got any kind of bad reaction or anything, especially when they're like, oh, the there's NFTs on the on XRP, and you know, they wanted to hear more. I, I think there there was more of like people being inquis you know, inquisitive of like just trying to figure out like why, you know, how is this possible? Like they, they haven't heard of this before. And, um, you know, a lot of people were surprised and we got actually a, a really positive feedback from, you know, almost everybody. And I think contributing to this is probably also Solana because right now, you know, a lot of people, Solana and ETH, you know, Solana is doing more volume, DEX volume than Ethereum. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's really giving them a hard time, like the hardcore ETH folks. But it also let a lot of conversations happening where people said, you know what, it seems just like, you know, it's multi-chain and I got to be more flexible and other chains have a very, very fair shot to be as big as, as we are, you know, like from an ETH perspective. And um, so I think the narrative is, uh, is breaking and I hope more people will be more open, of course, and going forward. But even though, you know, Adam said, said it very well, uh, generally speaking, especially in IRL, uh, people are more friendly. Uh, you know, on, on X or Twitter, you, you <laughs> it's a different story, but IRL, everybody is friendly. 
Um, yeah, tw- I mean, Twitter's what? definitely not reality. I think you get yeah, a lot definitely. of trolls and just a lot of yeah, a lot of just you know negative stuff on social media, and it's definitely not like that in the in the real world, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the last time I went to uh, BTC Miami, there were a bunch of pinatas with XRPs on it. <laughs> and the name of the booth was like Smash the Shit Coin or something like that. So you had like the XRP pinata, you had the, uh, the AVAX pinata, the Soul pinata. It was, um, it was great. What? And I was walking around with the rip with the t shirt. I'm risking was the my life. Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah this- probably so. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like Bitcoin people are like just a different breed in, in, in general, you know. Yeah, I, I think so yeah. too. I mean, you want to discuss decentralization? Let's fucking discuss decentralization. You know, I'm open <laughs> to having that discussion. Let's talk. <laughs> I converted Ju- a bunch of people there. Nice. Yeah. Ju- look, Julian. So if you meet Julian at uh, any of these conferences, he he loves to talk, and you know he has no problem with you know, facing you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem facing. No, that is that is good. Yeah, that's in a good. nice, respectful manner, of course, constructively. Of course. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so it was a really nice conversation, Shen. What do you think? Shall we? Yeah, I think probably time to wrap it up here. Yeah, keep keep the because it's recorded space. So for anyone who's recorded, um, keep it like one and a half hours, so people have a good time also listening back. It's not like a five-hour thing. Nobody will listen uh, record, listen to the recording, but we kept it really good. <laughs> no, it was really great. Great conversation. Absolutely, yeah. So with that, um, I absolutely thank. Uh, I think Sloppy dropped, yeah, but thanks Sloppy for coming up. It was really great to hear your perspective, especially from a gamer like you. Um, same they for, of course, Goose. Sure. This guy in San Francisco. He, I mean, he has to watch out for safety, so I get that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, and, and thanks Goose for coming up as as per usual. Um, Adam, you you made you made it up there. Uh, Pleb and Julian, it's, it's always always great to talk to you guys. Uh, catching up here on gaming and NFTs on XRP Ledger, wonderful. And yeah, we're right back to you. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. That was um yeah, it was really good. Appreciate everyone for being here. And um Thank you yeah, guys. excited for everything that's coming for the XRP this year. I think there's yeah, there's really a lot coming, so it should be good. Let's, Let's go. go. Yeah. Let's go. Bye everyone. <laughs>